It's always been my prayer that I might be like Jesus. We have the lights out now, please. And we, some of us, and I happen to be one, is do not have, uh, what should I say, I'm a recluse, I guess. And actually, I, if I had my druthers, I would druther be uh, in almost an isolation, I guess. And I recognize this and realize that as a minister of the gospel, that I couldn't be like that. And so I've had to pray that I might have more of the likeness of Jesus. And that the Lord would give me more of the personality of Jesus. And I I think it's well for us all to want to be like our Savior. And as uh, Brother Luba prayed tonight, you know, we're going to see Jesus soon. And when we see him, the Bible says we're going to be like him. So I want, if there's anyone I want to imitate or be like, it's Jesus. I want to have his personality I know I come far short of having it, but I want to have his patience, his purity, his love, his kindness, and all the attributes that Christ has. I never have asked the Lord for um, uh, charisma and all that sort of thing and a dashing personality. Uh, I just don't have it, and I never will. But And surprising, you may think uh, that... I, of all people, you know, having held meetings all over uh, this country and even out of this country, that and meeting so many thousands of people that I would be an outgoing person, but I'm not. Actually, sometimes people scare me. <laughs> I think we all have, you know, things like this to some degree. So I want to be like Jesus. And Peter who has been a faithful follower of Jesus, though he made his mistakes. But when he was condemned to die by the Roman emperor, he um, said that he would want to be crucified upside down. Now, it was very common for the Romans to crucify those that they considered criminals. Peter was not a criminal, but he was a Christian, and he was propagating the truth of God and and the pagan Romans did not like this, so they they condemned him to die, just as they did the Apostle Paul. With Paul, however, they did it differently. They beheaded Paul, but uh, they crucified Peter. And so this is not an upside-down picture, but um, Peter was crucified upside-down, which must have been a very excruciating, horrible death. He didn't feel worthy to even be crucified like Jesus. So he must have loved him. I'm sure he did. Loved him with all his heart. And someday, if you and I are faithful, we're going to meet Peter in the kingdom. It's going to be great, you know, to meet uh, people like this. And he's a great man, very impetuous. And uh, Jesus named him Peter, which means a rolling stone, because he was rather unstable when Christ met him. And uh, the Bible, you know, speaks about Jesus saying, Thou art Peter. And he used the word Petros, P-E-T-R-O-S, which means a rolling stone. But he said, And upon this rock, and he used a different word, Petra, P-E-T-R-A, and that means a great foundation stone. I will build my church, Jesus said, on this foundation stone. But uh, it has been misunderstood. The church of Rome says that Jesus built his church on Peter, and uh, and, uh, Peter is the rock. No, Jesus didn't say he was the great foundation stone. He said, you're a rolling stone. Petros, rolling stone. Thou art Peter, the rolling stone. But upon this great foundation stone... I will build my church. And who is that? Jesus is the rock, the rock of ages, the chief cornerstone, the Bible says. Well, anyway, we're going to um, do a little bit of violence tonight to the Scriptures by uh, resurrecting Peter, which we're not able to do, of course. 
but somewhere outside of the city of Rome, he was crucified upside down. And so there he is, uh, resurrected in a special resurrection. The Lord would have to do this, of course. And uh, he starts on his way down the Appian Way, which is one of the main roads going into and coming out of Rome. And so Peter's walking along, and he realizes very quickly that he's living in a different age. And uh, he realizes that uh, he may not be able to cope with uh, this age, because it's changed from when he was living 2,000 years ago. So he hires a guide. And um, the guide uh, soon finds out that Peter is uh, resurrected and uh, that this is the Peter, St. Peter, that was one of the disciples of Jesus. And so the very first thing that Peter sees walking along with his guide is the Roman Colosseum. And this is a, a, a building where terrible atrocities occurred during the time of the pagan Roman Empire. They had their uh, gladiator battles. Uh, that was one of the entertainments. Another one of the entertainments was to take the Christians and uh, drive them out into the arena and then set upon them lions and other animals, tigers, panthers, who were hungry. They saw to it the animals were hungry. And they would watch as these animals tore the Christians apart. And then when they had their gladiator shows, they would uh, hang Christians on posts all around and put fires under them and set them afire and use them as human torches as they carried on their um, festivity or whatever you want to call it. Sometimes the Caesar himself would be, in fact, many times the Caesar was there, is one of the entertainments of the pagans. And they hated the Christians, and they wanted to abolish them if they could. So when Peter sees the Roman Colosseum, he's surprised. And he, because he knows it's been 2,000 years, and he says to the guide, I'm surprised that that building is still there. And the guide says, well, it's the most popular tourist attraction we have. And it's true, you know. Hundreds of thousands of people go there, and I've been there. Actually, it's a masterpiece of architecture because they could seat, I think, around 30,000 or more people in this arena, and uh, they could empty it out in just a matter of a few minutes. The reason why, because it had numerous exits, many, many exits. You can see all the exits around uh, the bottom there, and... Uh, Today, architects could learn a lesson from this building. They build these big uh, arenas or big stadiums today, and sometimes it takes you, it seems like, hours to get out when there's a big crowd. But uh, Peter says to the guide, I'm surprised that it's still here. I would think that the Christians uh, would tear it down, and they'd try to get rid of it because it was such a ignoble place, such a horrible place where Christians died by the thousands, many of them. Well, as they come in to the city of Rome, uh, Peter sees people bowing before men. And some of the men are in white or black and others are in scarlet and various colors. And Peter says to the guide, what are these people doing? And the guide says, well, they're bowing down uh, before these men, Peter said, well, who are the men? And the guide says, well, they are the leaders, the dignitaries of the church, the bishops, the cardinals, and the priests. And they have power over these people. They can forgive their sins. And uh, they can uh, deprive them of forgiveness if they want to. They either give them absolution or refuse it. And Peter said, well, this is not right. God tells us that we're not to bow down and worship man. And no man has the power over other men's souls. No man has the right to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Peter is very, very uh, concerned about this. Well, they finally get to the great cathedral. And Peter says to the guide, what is that magnificent big building? 
And the guy says, well, that's uh, St. Peter's, St. Peter's Cathedral. And uh, Peter says, what do you mean St. Peter's? Well, he says, it's named after you, Peter. Peter says, you mean they built that magnificent building in honor of me? And the guy says, why, yes, yes, Peter, you're the, you're the head of the church. And uh, Peter said, no, I was never the head of the church. Uh, James was the head of the church councils, uh, the brother of Jesus, not me. And uh, Peter said, my, that must have cost a lot of money to build that building. And the guy said, well, I don't know what it cost back when it was built years ago, but today uh, it's estimated that it's worth well over a hundred million dollars. And Peter is shocked, and he says to the guy, well, what a pity that all that money has been spent on such an elaborate building. Why didn't they use that money to spread the gospel of Jesus to the world? And the guy said, well, I don't know about that, Peter. And he began to think, Peter's a little bit strange. Well, they finally uh, go into the building, and Peter's still marveling as he looks at the magnificence of this building. And if you've ever been there, it is a very imposing structure. And Peter remembers how when he was out on the streets and one time a beggar, a man who was uh, crippled, asked him for money. And uh, Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And the man did. He arose and walked. And as Peter is telling the guide about how he had no money, when he was one of the apostles of Jesus, the guide said, well, the church today can't say silver and gold have we none because the church is rich. And he said, neither can the church say to cripples today, rise up and walk. And that's the difference, you see. Well, they go into the building, and there is an, an antechamber where Peter sees a lot of the dignitaries of the church bowing down before an image. And he says to the guide, what is that image? And the guide said, well, that's Mary, the mother of Jesus. And Peter said, they're not to be bowing down to her. Mary's dead. Oh, the guide said, the church says, no, she's not dead. She's in heaven. Peter said, no, Mary is dead. The Bible never said she went to heaven. She will when Jesus comes. And God never intended for his people to worship Mary. We are to worship Jesus. And Jesus is the only mediator we have between man and God. Mary can't intercede for us before God. And here they were uh, uh, saying their prayers. And Peter said, what are they doing? He noticed they had beads in their hands. And the guy said, well, they're spelling their beads. They're saying the Hail Marys. And the more of these they say the less time they have to spend in purgatory. And Peter said, what's purgatory? I never heard of that. It isn't in the Bible. And he said, why are they saying these repetitious prayers over and over again? Because God told us not to do that. Jesus said, when you pray, use not vain repetitions. And he said, they are defying and disregarding the counsel of the Lord Jesus. And that's serious. Well, then he said to the guide, the Bible tells us that we're not to worship images. And that's one of the commandments. The commandment says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. And the guy said, Oh, well, you can see around, you know, all around the walls here, there's lots of images, and the church believes in worshiping images. And Peter said, Well, that's contrary to the law of God. And then the guide said, but the church says that it is above the law of God. Oh, Peter said, that's, that's blasphemy. That's blasphemy. And it's blasphemy, Peter said, for a man to claim that he can forgive sins. No man can do that. Well, the guide said, I'm sorry, Peter, but the church believes and teaches that. Well, about this time, they brought in a man, sat him on a throne, Peter said, who is that man? Why are those people bowing down worshiping him? Oh, he said, Peter, that's the vicar of God. He's God on earth. And uh, Peter said, oh, there's no man on this earth that's a God. And the vicar and the representative of God on earth is the Holy Spirit. That's what God says. 
The Holy Spirit is the representative of God on earth today. And so he's quite shocked and, and he's quite uh, getting a little bit loud about this. And the guy says, you better hush up. If the people hear you saying these things, they're going to uh, they're going to attack you. Well, Peter said this is a fulfillment of the prophecy of the apostle Paul, because Paul said that a man would arise and he would sit in a temple and he would claim to be God and he would be worshipped as God. And Paul said that this is the man of sin. And the guy said, "Well, Peter, you better not say that too loud." Uh, the people won't like that. Well, he finally pulls Peter up by the arm and leads him out of there. He said, we better get out of this place before somebody hears you. And when they get outside, why, uh, Peter says, who are these men standing out here with guns? And the guy said, well, they're the Swiss guard. They're, they're the men who, who guard the pontiff, you know. He's very important. They have to protect him. And Peter said, why? Why are they carrying guns? Why aren't they carrying Bibles if they are his apostles? And the guy said, well, they're really not apostles, Peter. They're soldiers. And, uh, but Peter said, but Jesus said to me that I was not to carry a sword. And when I took out a sword and cut off the ear of one of those soldiers who was uh, taking Jesus captive, Jesus said, put up your sword into his place. For all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And so Peter said to the guide, we're, we're God's people and we don't have to carry guns. We're not to go around with guns. We should be carrying the Bible and carrying the gospel to all the world. Well, about this time, uh, they bring the pontiff out and men are carrying him on their shoulders. And Peter turns to the guide and said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know he was a cripple. And the guy said, no, he's not crippled. He's just a holy man. And he doesn't walk on common ground. Well, Peter said, well, Jesus did. And Jesus didn't uh, go around uh, on the shoulders of men. But he walked on common ground and went into the homes of the people and healed the sick. And he even carried his own cross, which weighed over 200 pounds. And... Uh, he, Peter said, well, maybe I better talk to this uh, pontiff. And the guy said, well, I don't think you can get to him, and you better not talk to him because the people around him, his uh, uh, servants or men who serve him, uh, they, they won't let you talk to him, especially in your attitude of mind. And so Peter said, well, if I can't talk to him, uh, maybe I could talk to his wife. Where's his wife? And the guy said, oh, Peter, uh, what's wrong with you? He doesn't have a wife. It is forbidden. And uh, Peter said, you mean he can't have one? And the guy said, no, that's forbidden. He has to be celibate. And uh, the priests and all of the bishops and cardinals, none of them have wives. They're not allowed. It's forbidden. And people said, well, this is another thing the Bible said, that in the latter times some will depart from the faith speaking lies and hypocrisy, and forbidding to marry. And Peter said, this is the false antichrist system that the Bible prophesied would come. And uh, he said, I, I, I need to tell the people. And the guy said, you better not try. They won't listen to you. They won't accept what you're saying. And so he said, Peter, I think we better go get in a hotel and get a night's rest and... Uh, as they're walking toward the hotel, Peter is remembering the prophecy of Daniel 7, where it speaks about the Antichrist, where it says he shall speak great words against the Most High God, and will wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And the guy said, yeah, the church does claim that it has the right to change God's law. And they've changed the law. They've changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. And Peter said, why, this is a fulfillment of what the Bible predicted. Don't the people know this? And the guide said, no, the people, they love, they love this kind of religion, and they love the Ponivan, and they worship him. And uh, don't you say anything that the people can hear because they'll mob you. Well, they finally get to the hotel. And Peter has already told the guide, he said, uh, is there any other religion in this country but uh, this papal power? 
the Church of Rome. And the guide says, no, the Church of Rome dominates Europe. And Peter tells him that he'd like to go somewhere because he believes that God must have a true people, a true church somewhere in the world. So the guide said, well, there is a, a new land since you died called America. And a lot of people fled from Europe because they didn't want to be dominated by the Pope and they didn't want to have kings ruling over them as dictators. And so they went to America and, and they're called Puritans. And uh, Peter said, well, that's where I want to go. If that's where God's people are and that's where his church is, I want to go. Well, they go into the lobby and first thing that the clerk asks Peter is, where are your papers? Papers? What papers? You don't have a passport? No. You don't have any identification, a, a driver's license? Peter said, what's that? And uh, the, the man says, well, you know, uh, with the troubles in the world, we can't just let anybody in. We have to watch out and be careful. You have to have papers. And uh, uh, Peter doesn't have any papers, and the guide finally steps forward and explains to the clerk that uh, Peter is uh, one of God's apostles, and he doesn't try to explain that he's resurrected or anything like that. And he is a great man of God, and so the uh, clerk finally agrees to let him stay in the hotel, and the guide says, uh, tomorrow I'm going to take him out of this country. I already have the papers for us to go to America, and I've already uh, made the reservations for us. So the next day, he takes Peter, we're getting in a hurry, you see, to the port, and he says to Peter, now let's get on the ship, and Peter said, my, I've never seen anything like that. That's a tremendous ship. All I've ever seen is those little fishing boats that we had on the Sea of Galilee. And Peter is just overcome with amazement as he sees this giant ship. And when he gets on, he sees all the things that they have and realizes that this is a floating city. But Peter is not too impressed with all of this. And he goes to the cabin, and there he finds an address to draw a Gideon Bible and in it it says, you know, this is a Bible you may have if you wish. And Peter's so thrilled to get this Bible. And he sits down at the little desk there and he opens up the Bible. And he finds a book of Revelation written by John, his uh, co-worker as an apostle of Jesus. And he remembers that John uh, was the only one that lived, you know, after they were all dead. He knew that John was going to go on and live and that he would probably have the last word. And the book of Revelation, he saw that, and he started reading that because he believed that that was the final revelation of Jesus to the world. And it said so right then in the very first chapter. It was a revelation of Jesus for the church. And so Peter studies, and he finds out about the woman in white in Revelation 12, and uh, the commandment-keeping church, and he's thrilled to find that God does have a people and a church, a true, a true church, a pure church, like the woman in white. And then he reads Revelation 17. He reads about the woman in scarlet, the great whore, who has harlot daughters, and he realizes that that's the false church. And uh, then he reads Revelation 14 and finds out that God has a special message for the world down here in the end called the three angels' message. The hour of God's judgment has come, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, and a warning against the beast and his mark or the Antichrist. And Peter said, my, this is a great message, and I wonder where God's people is. Where are the people preaching this message? I want to find them. I want to have a part in giving this message to the world. Well, they finally reach New York City, and they come out with their baggage on the street. And you can imagine how Peter is startled to see these gigantic buildings with uh, what seems like millions of lights, windows with lights on. And, and Peter just can't understand. He says to the guide, where do they get all that light? They must have tremendous candles. And the guy said, no, they're not candles. Uh, those are electric lights. And, of course, Peter said, what, what is electric lights? 
And the guy tries to explain. No, it's awful hard to explain. He didn't know anything about it. And uh, he's really confused. And about that time, he sees a, a great streamlined train coming into the city with his horn blowing. And he turns to the guy. He said, what is that great uh, um, serpent-like monster that's coming into town? And uh, the guy said, that's not a serpent, Peter. That's a train. And uh, it's just a streamlined train. And Peter said, my, I've never seen anything like that. And he steps out in the street and uh, cars are coming along and horns are blowing and the guide has to grab Peter and pull him back. He's almost run over by a New York taxi cab. And Peter said, what, what, what was that? And the guy said, oh, that's just an automobile. What is an automobile? Well, that's a machine that man has built, you know, to, to get around. And then about that time, why uh, uh, a great giant jet is taking off over their heads, and, and uh, Peter hears that roaring of the jet engines. And he said, look, look, there's a bird. Look at that giant bird up there. And the guy said, no, that's not a bird. That's a flying machine. And Peter said, what do you mean by that? Oh, he said, that's a machine that men fly in. He said, we could fly in one of those. Peter said, no, I don't want to fly in that. Not yet. He said, I'll wait until Jesus comes and takes me to heaven, and I'll fly. And uh, so he's amazed. And uh, the guide tells him how these planes can fly across the country in just a few hours. And they have planes that can fly from America to Europe in just a few hours. And he, he's just thinking about the prophecy of Daniel how in the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. And Peter turns to the guide and said, we must be living in the time of the end. And the guide says, well, I don't know about that, Peter. I don't think we want to talk about that. People uh, are not interested in hearing about the time of the end. They get in their room, and uh, the guide goes over and turns on the TV. And Peter jumps out of his chair and he said, well, what's that man doing over there? How did he get in that box? How did he get in this room? And the guide said, no, Peter, he's not in that box. He's uh, playing his instrument over in California. And uh, Peter said, where's that? And he said, well, that's over 3,000 miles away. Peter said, no, that can't be. He's right in the box. I see him. And I can hear him. I couldn't hear him if he was 3,000 miles away. And the guy said, well, Peter... Uh, they are projecting his picture uh, out into the air. And it's uh, going out into the air. And there's, uh, on top of this building there's an antenna. And he tries to explain to Peter what that is. And that antenna is picking up that picture out of the air. And then it's coming down into this room on a little wire. And Peter blinks his eyes and says, Oh, he said, you're kidding me. And the guy said, no, no. He said, that's real. He said, that's television. He said, you can project these pictures out into the air and uh, people can see these things over in Europe and many thousands of miles away. Peter said, my, this is a marvelous invention. He said, this is a wonderful way to give the message of the Jesus soon coming to the world. He said, I'd like to be able to uh, give my message on TV. And the guy said, well, I think you'd have a difficult time getting on, Peter. But then about that time, the telephone rings, and Peter jumps up again. He said, what's that? And the guy said, that's just telephone, Peter, just be calm. And he picks up the receiver and starts talking, and then Peter's standing there with his eyes bugging out and uh, wondering what it's all about. And finally, the guide puts the receiver down. Peter said, what in the world is that? Why were you talking into that little instrument? And the guide said, well, that's a telephone. And I was talking to relatives. They knew I was going to be here. I wired ahead. And they called me from Chicago. And Peter said, where's Chicago? Oh, well, uh, that's about 500 miles away. And Peter said, oh, that's impossible. I was standing right next to you. I couldn't hear anything. How could you hear people 500 miles away? And uh, the guy said, well, there again, Peter, he said, they pick up a little instrument, call a telephone, and they dial a number, 
and they talk into that, and it goes through a little wire, and that wire comes all the way here, and the bell rings, and I pick up this little instrument, and they're talking, and I listen, and I can hear them 500 miles away. And Peter just can't believe it. He said, this is marvelous. My, what a great advance the world has seen in scientific knowledge. No wonder that Daniel said that knowledge would be increased and men would be running to and fro in the time of the end. Well, the next day, the guide takes Peter to the United Nations. He said, now, Peter, I want you to visit this august body. This is the place where the great peacemakers of the world are gathered. And they're going to save the world from destruction. They are the great peacemakers. Well, Peter sits down, but he gets pretty nervous when he hears some of the speeches that they're making in the United Nations. And he hears them talking about war in Somalia and uh, war in Bosnia and Serbia, Yugoslavia. And he hears about war in the Near East. And he... Here's about all of these uh, terrible things that are happening, like the bombing of the trade center in New York City. And he's just trembling in fear. And he turns to the guy, is this the body that's supposed to keep the peace of the world? And the guy said, yes, Peter, this is the United Nations. They're united for peace. And people, Peter said, well, uh, I don't see any chance of peace uh, as long as they're fighting like they are and hate each other like they seem to be. And Peter said, you know, in Revelation, I was reading just last night how John the Revelator was shown that down in the end that the nations would be angry and it would be in the time when God's wrath God's final judgments are going to fall upon the earth. Peter said the nations are angry. I can see these men are angry. They're up there fighting. They're arguing. And they're demanding this and demanding that. And there's war here and there's war there. Why, Peter said this is a sign of the end. And Jesus said that there would be wars and rumors of wars and there'd be world wars down in the end of time. And Peter said, I, I need to tell people about this. I need to get up and preach this. Well, the next day, the guide takes him to an Army Air Force demonstration to show the modern weapons of war. And uh, they get seated in the bleachers, and the thing's about to begin. And suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, come these jet fighters screaming down over their head. And Peter jumps out of his seat, and, he, and they're dropping their uh, miniature fire bombs. They can't drop anything too big because there are people close by. And they have buildings they erected to blow up uh, to uh, simulate uh, an attack and, and war. And Peter is climbing underneath the seat. And uh, he's just trembling all over. The guy said, Peter, get up here and watch this. And Peter said, I'm, fr I'm frightened. Uh, they're going to blow me to bits. And uh, the guy said, no, Peter, this is just a demonstration. And Peter said, do they actually use things like this in war? That they can bl blow up entire buildings? And, and then they have a demonstration of missiles. And the guy tells Peter that these missiles now can be shot across the ocean. And they can be uh, armed with atomic warheads. And they can blow up entire cities. And they can even come with multiple atomic warheads and, and destroy thousands, yea, millions of people. And, and Peter's thinking, you know, about the final destruction in the world and, and how Christ said that he was going to come to this world and destroy those who were trying to destroy the earth. And he said, Jesus is going to have to come if this world is going to be saved from destruction. And then they had a simulation of an atomic explosion, just a little one. And uh, when Peter sees this, he said, what is that? And the guy said, well, Peter, that's just a demonstration of an atomic bomb. And the guy, uh, Peter says to the guy, what is an atomic bomb? And the guy tries to tell him, you know, this is a nuclear weapon. And it's so powerful it can just destroy an entire country if they throw a blow up a lot of them in a land it would just destroy it and Peter said my this must be the time of the end the men are getting ready in this world to destroy it we need to tell them that Jesus is coming soon and get ready to meet the Lord and the guy said well Peter the people don't want to hear that they don't want to hear about the end of the world and the coming of the Lord so 
Peter gets up. He said, I want to get out of here. He said, I, I can't stand this. So they leave. And as they're leaving, Peter tells the guide, you know, Paul said that uh, when they're saying peace, peace and safety, then sudden destruction is going to come upon them. And the guy said, well, yeah, we hear a lot about peace, and we have the United Nations talking peace, and today uh, some of the nations are disarming. Russia now has uh, given up its uh, warlike uh, ways, and uh, the world is talking, you know, we're going to have universal peace. And uh, Peter said, we better watch out. Because the Bible prophesies that when they're saying peace, peace and safety, sudden destruction is going to come. The guy said, well, Peter, I don't want to hear about sudden destruction. Nobody wants to hear about that. That's too gloomy. And so that night he says, I'm going to take you out on Broadway. So he takes Peter out on Broadway in New York City. And again, Peter can't understand. Well, all these thousands of people milling in the streets, and they're pushing and shoving to get into the show places and into the nightclubs and the bars and the taverns and the topless shows. And Peter sees all of this right there. And he says, are these people Christians? And the guy said, yeah, many of them are. Not all of them, but many of them are. You mean, Peter says, they go to church? Oh, yes, many of them will be to church Sunday morning. Uh, do they really believe in God? Yes, oh, yes. And uh, Peter said, well, why aren't they home praying? Why aren't they studying their Bibles? Why aren't they getting ready for the coming of the Lord? As they're walking along ahead of them is a young woman who's smoking a cigarette. And Peter hadn't noticed people smoking up until now. And he sees the smoke rising over her head as she's walking along. And there's a window washer washing a, a window of a store uh, there on, on uh, Broadway. And Peter rushes over and grabs his bucket of soapy water and runs up to this woman and throws it on her. And she is spitting and sputtering. And she's saying, you maniac, what are you trying to do? Why did you do that to me? And Peter can't understand. He thought he was doing a favor. He thought she was on fire. He said, oh, I thought you were on fire. And so the guide hurries over and, and uh, stands between them. And he says to the woman, I'm sorry. And uh, if you have any damage and you need dry cleaning or whatever, uh, we're staying at such and such a hotel. Send the bill and we'll take care of it. And by that time, a crowd was gathering around because she was just screaming at Peter. And uh, the guide took Peter by the arm and hurried him away. And uh, Peter said, what did, what did I do? What did I do? And he said, Peter, you, you did, the, did the wrong thing. And Peter said, why? I thought she was on fire. What, what was that smoke from? And, and the guide said, well, that's from cigarettes. She was smoking a cigarette. And Peter said, what's a cigarette? Well, then the guy had to explain to him, you know, how this was something the people used to calm their nerves and, and uh, maybe to give them a lift when they were down. And, and uh, Peter said, is this some kind of a drug? And uh, the guy said, yeah, it does have nicotine in it and anything with a T-I-N-E on the end of it, like morphine and codeine and nicotine and caffeine, uh, they're all drugs. And... Uh, then, as they're walking along, they see a young lady uh, making a cigarette. And Peter said, what is she doing? Oh, he said, that's probably um, pot. P Peter said, pot? What's pot? Oh, he said, that's a, a mild form of drug that the kids like to use. And Peter said, my, oh, my, are people harming their bodies? Don't they know that the Bible says that our bodies are the temple of God? And if any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy? Well, the guy said, oh, but Peter, these people are having fun. And it's their pleasure. And they do it for fun. And Peter said, this is not fun. Not if they're hurting their bodies, the temple of God. They will be destroyed when Jesus comes. We must honor these bodies because the Holy Spirit is to dwell within us. And how can he dwell within us if our bodies are polluted with something unclean? So Peter said, I think I, think I, I need something to eat. So the guide takes him into a, one of the fashionable clubs there in New York City and smoke filled. And Peter's choking on the smoke. He said, this is awful. What are all these people smoking these cigarettes? 
I wish they'd quit it. It's going to kill them, and it's going to kill me if I don't get out of here. And the guy said, oh, Peter, but this is a good place to eat. Sit down. And the people are drinking and laughing, and they have an orchestra, and the, and the orchestra st- uh, strikes up the band. They start playing some real jazzy song, and the couples all jump up, and they hurry out on the dance floor, and they start wiggling and jumping and jerking and throwing, waving, flinging their arms around. And, and uh, Peter says to the guy, we better call for a doctor. These people are having a fit. And the guy said, no, they're not having a fit, Peter. They're just dancing. Peter said, why, I can't understand this. This is the way the the heathen danced back in my day. They used to do all kinds of wild dancing when they became devil-possessed. Oh, the guy said, but they're having fun, Peter. They're having fun. Peter said, I want to get out of here before I choke to death. And so the guy said, Peter, I don't know what to do with you. I don't know where to take you. Peter said, I need something to eat. I haven't eaten now for hours. And so the guy said, well, there is a gourmet dining place down here in the side street. I've heard about it. And they have all kinds of gourmet dishes. They, they serve rare things. They even have uh, French fried worms and, and, uh, <laughs> and grasshoppers. And um, they have rattlesnake steaks. And uh, hippopotamus steaks. And, and Peter said, oh, please stop. I'm getting sick. Don't, don't tell me all those things. And so the guy said, you don't want to go there? And Peter said, no, I'm already sick. And so then uh, the guy said, well, there's another place down here where we can get some delicious pork, uh, pork sandwiches. And, and so um, Peter said, no, I don't eat that. And... Uh, he said to the guy, do people actually eat these filthy, unclean things? And the guy, oh, yes, this is a delicacy. People eat the pig from his tail to his snout. They even eat his intestines. And he said, if you want some good chitlings, we can go there. And Peter said, I don't want chitlings. I don't want any of that unclean stuff. He said, well, they have pork tongue. And Peter said, I wouldn't eat it. the tongue. And he said, they have pickled pig's knuckles. And Peter said, I couldn't eat the knuckles, the, the feet of that unclean creature. And God said, the swine is unclean. And of their flesh shall you not eat it. The guy said, Peter, you're strange. Everybody eats these things. Peter said, I don't. And surely God must have a people who don't. And Peter said, to the guide, there must be an awful lot of sickness that people are eating these creeping, crawling, abominable, dirty creatures. And the guy said, oh, well, we don't consider them like that. We think they're very delicious. Well, Peter is so shocked, and he said to the guide, you know, I can see the world is like Paul said it would be in the latter days, perilous times, men lovers of selves, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Peter said, if these people are Christians, it must be a form of godliness. Oh, well, the guide said some of these people are pretty devout Christians. And some of them probably are, Peter said. But um, they evidently don't know any better. I think I should get out here in the street corner on Broadway, and I should call to the people to come around, and I should tell them what the Bible says about eating unclean things and using drugs. And I should tell them about the wars and rumors of wars that Jesus said were signs of His coming. And that this great peace movement like the United Nations, that this is a sign of sudden destruction. I should tell them. And the guy says, you better not, Peter. They wouldn't listen. They would...
PC. And he said, you know, maybe the Lord told you not to eat these unclean things. That was in the Old Testament, but today it's all right. They're all clean now. Peter said, they are? Who cleaned them? And uh, Peter said, you know, it just isn't for Old Testament because the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes, he will... Uh, well, we got past that one. That one's going forward. Can we go back? Now we're going forward. All right. That one skipped by. It's a text on there. Go back another one, please. My control is not working properly. I see now. All right. Now we'll go forward. Oh, we, now I put it forward and... It, it, and here is that text in Isaiah 66 that says, When the Lord comes, He's coming with fire, and they that sanctify themselves eating swine's flesh and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. And so Peter tells the guide, you know, it must be wrong to eat these things right down to the end because Jesus hasn't come yet. And when He comes, He's coming with fire. And those that are eating swine's flesh and mice and other unclean things are going to be destroyed by fire. Peter said, I don't want that to happen to me, and I don't think you do either. And uh, the guide said, well, I guess there are some people who do eat mice. And I said, I heard that in China and some places they, they eat baby mice and before they have matured and they don't have any fur, and they think that's a delicacy, and they dip them in honey. And then they swallow them while they're still alive. And they think that's a delicacy. And, and that's actually true, friends. And uh, people have eaten rats even in this country. I, when I was preaching back in Georgia, a woman told me that she went to visit a home where they served her what seemed to be white meat. And she thought it was chicken. She ate it. And she said, my, that was good. What was it? And they said, that was rat meat. So people actually have and do in some places eat these things. Well, anyway, they walk along the street now, and the guide has decided that Pete, he can't take Peter to any place to eat. He's going to just go to the store and, and get some fruit and vegetables and uh, crackers, and they're just going to snack. And as they're walking along, there's a great mob of people out there rioting on strike, and uh, they have a picket line, and they're carrying banners, and they're shouting down, down with this and down with that. And Peter said, what is this? And the guy said, oh, this is people on strike. They're on strike against the uh, rich corporations that they work for. And, and Peter said, oh, this is another sign of the coming of the Lord. For James prophesied that the rich men are going to weep and howl for their miseries that will come upon them. And the laborers are going to be crying out against the rich men. And that is going to be when the judge is standing before the door ready to come in. And so the Lord Jesus is our judge and he's going to come in soon. And uh, the guide said, well, Peter, nobody would believe that if you told them. Peter said, well, are there many of these things going on? The guide said, oh, yes, thousands of them all over the world. People go on strikes and there's rioting. And Peter said, well, this is a great sign of the end. Can't men see that these are evidences that Jesus is coming? The guide again says, oh, nobody wants to believe that. They're having a good time. People are enjoying themselves. He said they're having a good time out here rioting and picketing. Oh, yes, some people enjoy that too. Peter says, well, I can see that prophecy is being fulfilled. And I can see that this is one of those great sin cities, and I would like to get out of here. Surely we must go someplace where uh, we can find God's people. And the guide says, well, I'll tell you what, Peter, I have some friends in California. Let's go to California. So they get on the train. California. California bound. And um, they're traveling, and Peter's enjoying, you know, seeing the scenery, and he's enjoying this great machine that's going along there, 70, 80 mile an hour. And he said, this is wonderful. Oh, this is another great sign of, of men's knowledge increasing and men running to and fro. 
and uh, they finally uh, stop. The train stops for um, some making some changes, a change in the engine, and, and they're going to be there for an hour, an hour and a half. And the guy says, Peter, Peter, we have to wait here a while, so why don't we take a walk down through the city? Well, it so happens that that city is Las Vegas. And uh, Peter is all for going for a walk and getting some fresh air. But he's never seen anything like Las Vegas. And they go walking down the street and all he sees is gambling places and saloons and nightclubs and topless and all this sort of thing. And he sees thousands of people in there pulling the one-armed bandits and, and uh, gambling their hard-earned money and uh, hoping to get rich quick. And Peter sees all these things and the nightclubs there and the shows, the loot shows and all of this wild stuff. And Peter says to the guy, why, this is just like Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, the guy said, well, this is a fun city, Peter. Don't you want to go in? Let's go in and watch one of these shows. And Peter said, no, I wouldn't be caught dead in there. The Lord may come to my name in the judgment at any time. And I want to be ready. He said, let's get back on that train. Let's get out of here as quick as we can. The Lord said, as they were walking along, he says to the guy, the Lord said, you know, in the day of his coming, it's going to be like it was in Sodom. And he also said, in the day of his coming, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah. And he said, that's exactly what I see. He said, the world is just like it was in the days of Noah and in the days of Sodom. Can't the people see this? And the guy said, oh, Peter, I wish you'd quit talking about that. Well, they get to Modesto, and they decide to go to the churches. Peter said, well, I can see this is a nice town, and lots of churches, must be a lot of good people here, and I want to go find God's people. Surely God must have a people somewhere. And the guy said, well, they're having a, something special in this church today, and it's a very popular church, so they go in. And Peter said, what's special? The guy said, they're having a baptism. He said, oh, that's nice. I love baptisms. You know, we used to baptize in the Jordan River all the time. We just loved it. And he sits back and relaxes. And in a moment, they bring in a little baby. And Peter said, what's that baby doing here? And the guy said, well, he's going to be baptized. Peter said, did I hear you were right? Yeah, that's right. He's going to be baptized. Peter said, they're going to baptize that little infant? And the guy said, yeah, that's right. And Peter said, why, the Bible says we must repent and be baptized. That little baby doesn't know how to repent. He's, he doesn't even know he, uh, anything about sin. How can he repent? And the Bible says believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and then be baptized. And uh, he doesn't know anything about Jesus. He's just a little baby. And the guy said, well, that's what they do. And uh, Peter turns to the guy and he said, now what's that minister doing up there now? He said, oh, he's putting a few drops of water on the baby's head. He's sprinkling that baby. And they call it christening. And Peter said, why, that's not baptism. The Bible says we ought to be buried in baptism. And he's just putting a few drops of water on its head. And uh, this is not a baptism. This can't be God's way. We've got to get out of here. And so they leave there. And the guide hardly knows where to take Peter next. But they come to another church, and, and the guide said, I understand there's a very solemn funeral here today. And Peter says, well, all right. He said, uh, I've been to funerals. Let's go in. So they go in. They sit down. And the music is playing very solemn, and, and Peter uh, feels very solemn. He's wiping a tear from his eye as he sees the other people weeping. And... Um, Finally, the minister comes in, and he starts telling the people what a wonderful man this was. And the guide whispers in Peter's ear, well, Peter, he said, the truth is he was a corrupt politician, but he gave a lot of money to the church, so they're giving him a royal send-off. And Peter said, you mean to tell me that that man is a sinner? And the preacher's saying he's such a wonderful, good man? And the guy said, well, yeah, you know, Peter, that's the way they do it these days. And so uh, the 
preacher then comes to the end and he says, Now, you people, you don't need to be grieving. Uh, your friend is not here in this casket. He's already gone to be with God in heaven. And Peter said, What did he say? And the guy said, Well, he just said he's, the man's gone to heaven. And Peter said, Oh, no. What a terrible deception that is. He must not know the Scriptures. The Bible tells us that when a man dies, he doesn't know anything. He doesn't go anywhere except to the grave. That they're going to wait in the grave until Jesus comes and resurrects them. And that man is not immortal, Peter said. Only God has immortality, the Bible says. And He's going to give it to us at the end when Jesus comes. And He resurrects the dead. And why would He come to resurrect the dead if this man and all the others have already gone to heaven? And the guy said, well, I don't know, Peter. I don't understand this. And he said, I don't think there's anything I can do to help you. And Peter said, let's go to another church. So they go to another church. And here the preacher's preaching a very dynamic hellfire brimstone sermon. And the people are just uh, squirming in their seats. They almost feel like they're on fire as the preacher is screaming that the, the people, you know, will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and the people are going to burn for billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions. Oh my, Peter said, how could that be? Uh, they, they, they surely are going to burn up in the fire. There's going to be fire, all right. But they're not going to burn for billions of years. They'd have to burn like asbestos if they burn on and on for billions of years. And he said, I want to get out of here. This, this is making me very uncomfortable. These people are scared to death. That preacher is frightening them. They, they just, they just are scared. He said, I want to get out of this. This is not the way it should be. Well, as they leave, the, um, Peter tells the guide that the wages of sin is death, as the Bible teaches, and that sinners are going to be burned up. And the guide says, yeah, maybe their bodies burn, but their soul will live on forever. And Peter said, oh, no. The Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And the guide blinks at that. He said, Peter, you know so much, he said, but the people wouldn't understand if you were to tell them these things. Peter said, I wish this preacher, maybe I should tell him to read my second book of Peter. If he just read what I said. And uh, the Lord, you know, showed me these things. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And Peter said, the wicked are not being punished now. There is no place of hell now. But there will be someday. But it hasn't come yet. Nobody's gone to hell yet, but they will when the Lord finally destroys them. And then he, as they're walking along, he says, you know, the Bible teaches that we're going to tread down the ashes of the wicked when they are destroyed by fire. And when that day comes, the Bible says they're going to burn up. And the Bible also says in the book of Obadiah that the wicked are not going to be anymore. And... The Bible says into smoke they're going to consume away. They're going to burn up and turn to smoke and the fire shall devour them. They're never going to be anymore. God is going to destroy the wicked. God never promised that the wicked are going to live forever. And He made it very clear that the wages of sin is death and that is eternal death. And the guy said, well, I like that. It sounds better. But you're going to have a hard time convincing people of this. Well, they go to another church, and this is a very sophisticated church, and the minister has all kinds of degrees, and he gets up and is talking to the people, you know, about the Bible, and he tells me, you know, that intelligent people don't believe that all the Bible is true. You know, he tells them that some parts of it really aren't true. You know, he can't believe it all. And uh, we're pretty intelligent people, you know, and surely uh, God didn't create the world in six days. It had to be some evolution. It had to take millions and millions of years. And uh, uh, surely Jonah was not swallowed by a whale. That couldn't be. And You know, there's a lot of things in the Bible he's telling the people we can't believe. And he said, you know, we really, we believe in the new age. We're living in the new age. And according to that, we are all gods. Well, Peter said, 
uh, this man is not preaching truth. I want to get out of here. The Bible is all inspired, and parts of it are not untrue. It's all true. And God says that the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. When they wrote the Scriptures, the Holy Spirit was the one who guided them. So they go to another church, and this preacher's preaching a dynamic sermon. And, and Peter says, my, this sounds good. And he's sitting there, and this preacher is condemning sin, telling the people they need a Savior, and they need Christ. But um, they don't have to worry about obedience to Christ. All they have to do is say they believe in Christ. And Peter turns to the guide and says, well, the Bible tells us that the devils believe and tremble, but that won't save them. And then this man tells them, you know, people, the law of God has been abolished. It was nailed to the cross. You don't have to keep the commandments. Just believe in Jesus. That's all. And you'll be saved. And no matter what you do, you're under grace. You don't need to worry. You're going to get to heaven. And Peter said, this is a terrible thing to tell the people. The Bible doesn't teach this. And uh, the Bible teaches, you know, that God's commandments uh, will be in heaven as well as here on earth, and they are underneath the throne of God in heaven, and they are the expression of God's character. And Jesus said, Think not that I am come to destroy the law, not even one jot, dot of an I, or one tittle, cross of a T, would be uh, pass away from the law of God. He said, This will never happen. And so Jesus taught we must obey. And he said, if you love me, keep the commandments. And the Bible tells us, Peter says, that in right down at the very end, the very last chapter in Revelation, it says, blessed are they that keep God's commandments, for they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city of God. And Peter said, only those who obey God are going to enter into heaven. He said, this man is deceiving the people. And the guy said, well, if he's doing it, a lot of others are doing it too. Because most people today believe you don't have to obey the commandments anymore. And uh, Peter said, oh, that's why there's so much trouble in the world. That's why there's so much war. That's why there's so much crime. That's why so many people are using drugs and narcotics. Well, the guy said, let's go for a ride, Peter. And he takes them for a ride out Highway 132. And they finally come to a little town called Waterford. And people, Peter looks around. He says, you know, it's a pretty nice town. And they're coming through Waterford. And finally, Peter yells at his guide, stop, stop. And he grabs him by the arm. And the guy said, what is it? What is it? And he puts on the brakes and he stops. Peter said, did you see that sign back there? And the guy said, what sign? He said, there's a sign back there in front of that church. It says that they're preaching prophecy, revelation lectures. And he said, that's where I want to go. Well, I don't know how we got this other slide up here. Can we back it up, Steve? This one on this side. Anyway, uh, they, they go into the church and uh, there's... Nobody there yet. It's early. No, not that far. Well, little devil, it will go forward. I guess this is it. I'm sorry. All right. So they get out and they go in. And as I said, the, the church is open. It just has been open. And nobody there except one or two people. And so Peter and the guy go in, sit down. And... Um, the guide says to Peter, Peter, you sure you want to be in this church? He said, these people are Seventh-day Adventists. And Peter said, what does that mean? He said, that means that they keep Saturday for the Sabbath. And Peter says, well, so do I. That's the day I kept. That's the day that Jesus kept. The Bible tells us that Jesus had the custom of going to the synagogue every Sabbath day. And so he was a Sabbath keeper. And uh, so the guy said, oh, but that's not very popular. Most of the people in the world keep Sunday. And Peter says, yeah, but we ought to obey God rather than man. We're not to look to men. We should do what God says. And it's serious business to disobey God. And so the guy said, oh, but Peter, uh, the Jews keep the Sabbath. And uh, God made it for the Jews. Oh, no, Peter said, that's a mistake. 
Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man. And he said there's no way that you can spell man by using the letters J-E-W. And the Lord made the Sabbath for mankind. And he made the Sabbath as a memorial of his great creative works, also a memorial of his great redemptive works, because the Bible says it's a sign of sanctification, that you're born again. And the guy said, oh, Peter, you sure you want to get mixed up with this? And Peter said, yes, I do. And he said, if these people keep the true Sabbath, they must be God's people. And if these people are Adventists, which means that they're waiting for the coming of the Lord, they are the kind of people I want to be with. And he can hardly wait. And he's sitting there. Finally, a few people come in. Peter's disappointed there aren't more people to come. But anyway, he's sitting there in great anticipation. And finally, the lights are dim. And the program begins. And pictures are flashed on the screen. And here's a man out there beginning to preach. And what is he talking about? Oh, he's talking about the end of the world. He's talking about Noah and the flood. And how the people back there in the days of Noah didn't believe that it was going to happen. And uh, the flood came and took them all away. And the preacher is going on telling the people how it's going to be like it was back in the days of Noah. The people won't believe. They won't accept it. And they will go on to destruction just like they did in the days of Noah. Only eight people were saved back there then. And uh, Peter said, you know, people think that the majority are going to be saved. But they weren't in the days of Noah. And so he's listening to the preacher now telling about how the coming of Jesus is getting near the soon coming of the Lord and Peter started to say amen amen praise the Lord and the people are looking around wondering who is this man that's uh, praising the Lord and uh, it's Peter and that's what he would do if he was here tonight well I tell you it wouldn't be that weak Peter would give rousing amen praise the Lord this is the truth if I ever heard it and so he's praising the Lord. And the preacher goes on and tells him that Jesus is coming as the lightning shining from the east to the west. It will not be secret. It isn't going to be a secret rapture. The Bible says that every eye shall see him when he comes. And the wicked as well as the righteous are going to see Jesus come. But the wicked are going to be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Uh, but the wicked are going to look up and say, this is our God, we've waited for Him, and now He's come to save us. And then He's going on and telling the people how this gospel of uh, the coming kingdom is being preached in all the world for witness. And, oh, Peter's thrilled by that. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that this message is going to all the world. And the preacher is telling them how this is the greatest missionary movement among Protestants in all the world. And this message is going to over 900 uh, countries and islands. And Peter shouts, praise the Lord, brethren. Praise the Lord. Keep up the good work. And the people all around, you know, are wondering, who is this man? Who is this man out there? And then he hears the preacher saying, our final message to the world is that the hour of God's judgment has come. That's the first angel's message. And the second message is that Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And God is calling His people to come out of the world, out of the confusion of the world, and not be uh, partakers of her sins, which is the transgression of the commandments of God. And receive not the plagues. And the plagues are about to be poured out upon the earth. And here is a final call. And Peter says, oh, this is wonderful. God is calling His people to come out. Come out of Babylon. And he's just so thrilled and he's amening everything as he hears the preacher telling about coming out of Babylon and standing with the people of God and helping to give the final warning to the world before Jesus comes. And then the preacher makes his final appeal and asks the people to pick up their cross and follow Jesus in the steps of Jesus just as Jesus was willing to take up the cross and die for us, the preacher is saying we must be willing to take up our cross and follow Jesus, even though the cross may be hard to bear. If we love Jesus, we must be willing to...
to obey him. And Peter jumps up, and he, he doesn't walk down to the altar when the preacher makes his call, but he runs, and he's calling out, Brethren, I'm with you. I'm so glad I found somebody teaching God's message. I'm with you, brethren. I want to help in giving this message to the world. I know that this is what Jesus wants us to do, and I want to have a part in it. I know He's coming soon. Where would you be, friend? Would you be by His side? Would you be responding to the call to surrender all to Jesus? Well, we've come through a lot of meetings, haven't we? And a lot of classes. We've heard the message that Peter loved. And we've heard about the nearness of the coming of Jesus and the importance of living a true Christian life for Him because we're soon going to be citizens of God's kingdom. I want to be one of those citizens, don't you? And I want to be there with Peter. I want to walk and talk with Peter, don't you? And I want to meet all those other men like Moses and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Daniel and David and all these great men of God and the Apostle Paul. Someday soon we're all going to meet Someday soon, we're going to meet at the feet of Jesus. Jesus died to make it possible. Tonight, we're going to give you a little card, and we want you to make a decision. I believe God wants you to make the decision. It's just a very simple little decision card. I believe it's important for us to really make our decisions firm. You know, this is a matter of life or death, really. So we're giving you this card. Well, the deacons pass them out now quickly. Perhaps we ought to turn some light on because we want you to put your name on this card and indicate by putting your name on it. As it says, it is my desire to step all the way out of the religious confusion and stand faithfully with God's remnant people. Would you make that decision tonight? It's very important. You may have made decisions before, but why don't you make this decision tonight? Let God know. It's not a matter of me or what I know, but let Jesus, who died for you, know that it is your decision. You know that he loves you, he died for you, and you want to be with him in his kingdom. So you want to put your name down there, your address, Put your church affiliation if you want to. You don't have to. And then as you leave, we're going to let you go now. As you leave, the hostesses and deacons out there in the lobby and by the door, please hand your card to them. If you don't have a pen or a pencil, ask somebody close to you. I wish we had had pencils to give to you. I have one up here if anybody wants it, but I can't get it to you. All right, just pass the pencil along if you have one, or borrow from your neighbor. Be sure. What? Oh, the pencil's behind the seats. All right, fine. Just use those. That's good. But do something for God tonight. Don't hold back. It's very important. And it's not so much a matter of joining a church, but it's a matter of pleasing our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. And being ready to go home when Jesus comes. That's very important, isn't it? I want to go home. Don't you? I want to see my loved ones again. I want to be with Jesus. Not only meet Peter, but I want to be with Jesus. That's what's going to make heaven such a wonderful place. All right, now we're going to have a closing prayer. Shall we bow our heads? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the wonderful truth of your holy word, the living Bible. Help us, Lord, to be willing to abide by the truth as it is in your holy word and as it is in Jesus. May we be willing to follow in the steps of Jesus. And as the Bible tells us, Lord, if we follow in Jesus' steps, we will be walking in the right way. 
So we want to walk in that way. We thank you, Lord, for these dear people who have been coming to the classes and to these meetings. We thank you that you've opened up your word to all of us, me included, Lord. I thank you that you've shown me these great truths. Thankful, Lord, that we can soon be with you in your kingdom. May we all be faithful until that great day, for we ask it in Jesus' name. And we thank you.